Hello everybody and welcome to the 93rd edition of the Frank and Stan chat and uh, for those watching on video you can see we've got a guest with us and the guest is Dan Morrow. Good morning Dan. Good morning. Good morning and uh, how are you Stan? Okay, um, things going on in the background but yeah we, we yeah, get yeah, through yeah. it. Yeah. I think uh, Stan's mother had a bit of a fall didn't she this yeah, week? She, she, she's 91 and she broke a hip so yeah. she's... Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I think she's she's on the mend, at least we th we hope she is anyway. We think she is, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, she's also got dementia, so we don't really know what she's... Uh... She's not the easiest patient, is she, at the moment, I think, oh, from what you're saying. She's refusing everything at the moment. Yeah. Okay, Stan. They're, 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 they're tough as old boots, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Dan, there, there may be some people who don't know who you are, so uh, can you just uh, give a little summary of who you are, what you're doing? Of course. Um, I'm sure there are many people who don't know who I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> So my name is Dan Morrow and I'm the trust leader for Dartmoor Multi Academy Trust, which is a family of schools based on the cooperative uh, movement in Devon. And we're a family of 18 schools, primary and secondary, and very soon to have a special school joining us in September. That's great. I mean, it's interesting that, Dan, you didn't call yourself the CEO, did you? You called yourself the trust leader. I, I, tend, I tend to prefer the title because we are chief executives, obviously, in this role, in the sense that we've got a responsibility as accounting officers and we've got a responsibility under the Charities Commission. However, in education, the title chief executive just doesn't sit well with me because it does sound too corporate, whereas I think I'm a trust leader and I lead in trust. And therefore, I think it's rather than talking about the mat, talking about our trust and the word trust is such a powerful word, isn't it? Because mm. it, it connotes so much which is positive and is collaborative and is based on cooperation. So it is the, the term I, I tend to use and prefer. It's interesting. I used to, I struggled with that CEO title. I I remember saying, uh, well, I'm the director or something. I, couldn't, I, I wish I'd come up with trust leader. I didn't, but I came <laughs> up with director. And uh, I remember uh, a, head, a head teacher, Georgina, who was absolutely brilliant, a primary head teacher in Leeds, said, but you're not a director, are you, Frank? You know, you're not. So why are you calling yourself something you're not? And I said, well, I can't come up with anything better, Georgina. That's the best I can do because I just don't like this CEO element of it. Um, yeah. So anyway, I mean, we should come up with that. I mean, this is this your second CEO role? Or, yes. or trust leader role, should I trust say? Trust leader role. Um, yes, so I was a trust leader for a primary um, family of schools in London and the South East before moving down to, I'd like to say sunny Devon, but actually I have never seen this much rain in my life. <laughs> <laughs> what, what brought the move then, Dan? Because it was, a, I think, was it a, su a surprise? I, I got a sense it was a bit of a surprise. I, you know, uh, I, I thought you were quite settled where you were. I was. Um, it wasn't something I was looking for, to be honest, and I was very happy where I was and we were doing some very, very good work. And, it was, you know, when sometimes you, you do that change piece and you're bringing everything together and you want to see the fruition and the benefits of the work. But during the pandemic and because of my own personal circumstances with my family and, you know, kids off at university, different phase of life, it just felt right, actually, to do something different. And I think secondly, I'm a big believer in the whole system. And the thing I looked at was the fact that outcomes in this area are below national standards at all key stages. And actually, there's no reason for that. They are really good kids and good schools and fantastic tight communities. But I don't think what's always understood is the, the rural disadvantage and isolation that comes from um, areas like this. And, I felt the need to challenge myself, but also, and as I say this um, respectfully, there are so many very good leaders in London and the South East, and I'm not saying there aren't in the South West, but I think that because I've got a lot of experience in, in the areas, it, it felt like a, a good move for me and hopefully a, a good move for the area as well. Yeah. So was it a cooperative trust you're in before? Yes. Uh, well, no. Yes and no. It wasn't based on the cooperative values, but it was language that we used very much because of my own views on the cooperative movement and the international cooperative movement. Right, right. So I was interested about how, I mean, I had 
I, I only had one sort of trust leader role, um, but I had two head teacher roles. And, and when I set up with the second one, I had a clear idea what I wanted, wanted to do. So is that the same with you? Have you been able to sort of hit it a little bit more running at it, you know? Well, yes and no, actually. I think it's, it is like my head chips. It's, I know what I need to do quicker. I know what I need to do slower, actually, <laughs> as well. So I'd say some things I've run at much more quickly and other things I've realized. I, I suppose what you start to understand is that the lived experience as well as the theory of change leadership and change management and knowing it's always about people. And so making sure that the culture and ethos aspects are absolutely right has to be done in parallel with the work we, we do around standards and school improvement. And I think potentially in the past, whilst I've always had a strong focus on people, I always reverted to, well, we need to get the school sorted. We, and that what I don't ever want to do is something that isn't sustainable and will flourish far more when I'm no longer there. Because, you know, the whole basis of the work we should be doing is we plant trees for someone else to sit under the shade of. That's your, yours, yours, isn't it, Stan, as well? You, yeah, you... but my, mine is very similar to that, but it was about talking with a, uh, on holiday in, in Greece with a, a guy who was planting olive trees that his grandchildren would actually harvest. And he was planting them now because his grandchildren would need to harvest them in the future. But how amazing is that? Yeah. 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 Okay, well, it's great to have you. Um, I know it's been a very, uh, well, for both you and Stan, it's been a sort of fairly you know, difficult week, but uh, uh, hopefully the next 20 odd minutes or so will, will be helpful for us, but uh, hopefully others will get something from it as well. So Stan, let's kick off with you with what's caught your eye this week. Well, away from away from the news for once, um, what's caught my eye this week is the importance of first impressions on the telephone. I've, I've been dealing with various companies this week, trying to sort out one or two things, and the significant difference between the, um, the support, the help, the attitude of, of customer service and the influence it has on me. Uh, for example, I won't give it any names, but there is one bank that I'll be moving an account from as a result. And there's another one that I would recommend, not a bank, another an insurance company that I was so pleased that they could help me, even though they didn't provide the service that I want. They helped me to find it somewhere else. Mm. Um, that and um, the water company and, and the way, how helpful they were. And I, to be honest, I wasn't expecting that. So it, it for me, what's happened this week has made me think how important the first impression is of a phone call. Uh, and it, uh, it reminds me of my first lead as an inspector where the, the secretary answered the phone when we rang the school to say, ha ha, we're off stead and we're coming. Um, and I asked, it was 10 to nine and I asked to speak to the head and she said, oh, he's not in yet. Um, but he'll be in, he's usually in around nine o'clock. <laughs> Wasn't it also though that he, it wasn't this on a Tuesday or something, but on a Monday night it does a disco, so he's always late in on a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it was, but it said so much about about the school, and it set a lot of things running before mm. we'd set foot in the school. Yeah. And I think now, you know, the, the the phone call that the head teacher has with Ofsted is so crucial, but so is the person who picks up the phone in the first place, because if that phone call comes and a passing person picks the phone up, they can say so much about your school before they've realised who they're talking to. Uh, and I just think it's not that difficult to be helpful when yeah. you're on the end of a phone line. And it's almost more, it takes more energy to be obstructive and, and, and argumentative. And so why, why can't we just move to a position that if you, particularly if you're in customer service, that's what you provide yeah, service yeah, yeah don't you think there's Dan? it's partly sometimes people can become fixated on this is what my job is rather than thinking this is the experience i want the other person to have with me. yeah quite, you know? quite problem. um it was just you know somebody telling you that the letter you've got in front of you with with the phone number on that you've just rung isn't that isn't doesn't exist the policy number at the top doesn't exist and you are wrong to suggest it does. It's just a, a bizarre conversation yeah, to have yeah, with somebody. Yeah. I remember being a local secondary school here um, uh, when I left Ofsted and was working in the local authority. I was making a visit there 
and uh, even though it's a local school our kids never went to that school um that we went to a school which probably wasn't at the time deemed to be as good um but we always felt there was a much we were much closer to the sort of culture of what that school was trying to achieve but i remember going to this other school and, and actually going in thinking or oh, not wanting it to be bad or anything but just i didn't really what people have said it was a really good school and uh, i thought oh yeah come on prove it but actually i was in the reception area and the and the the, the colleague who was on reception was really under a lot of pressure you could see a lot of children there and a few sort of uh, deliveries were coming in and she sort of was so polite in the way she dealt with me and said, oh yes we know you're coming and perhaps you'd like to sit over there and i'll make sure somebody comes down now i was waiting there only about two or three minutes and even though she had a queue of people there she stood up and came over and explained the reason why there was a bit of a delay you know and i thought you know she, here's a woman who was really the front front of house you know for for the school and was probably one of their greatest assets you know yeah. because actually made me feel within the first five minutes that this was a good school i don't know why i felt it but i could feel it you know but uh, don't you think that's often because and I, I know both of you have inspected but for me you walk into a school and you can feel the temperature and you can feel the atmosphere and i think sometimes in education we don't do enough to to think about actually how crucial our receptionists administrators and all of those who are in support and operational roles they're the backbone of the school and if if we get that right it goes very right but equally if we get it wrong it it goes very wrong because most parents and carers as well as those external to a school that is their point of contact and mm -hmm. it's so important and what I don't want to do in education or more broadly is revert to that sort of old stereotype of the doctor's receptionist, which is that actually they become gatekeepers as opposed to customer service focused. Yes, it's really I have a thing about and th what you might find difficult if anybody else tries this. Where have I good service? I try and report that good service as mm -hmm. a compliment back to the company. Several companies have rung to say, I, I want, and they say, Oh, you want the complaints? No, I, it's not a complaint. I want to, to I want to. <laughs> it's, it's the gratitude department. <laughs> but what they say is, We haven't got anybody. We haven't got anybody yeah. who you can ring and say, A job's been well done. If you want to complain, I can put you through to complaints, but we don't have anybody. And occasionally, where particularly a phone one, customer service, I've said, uh, have you got a manager that I can speak to? And immediately you, you can hear their voice change because they think you're going to make a complaint. And I have to say, I just want to tell them what a good job you've done. And, yeah. and you speak to the manager and the shock, you can tell the shock in the managers. You say, say I've just had this, this phone call about X and uh, the person I've been speaking to has done a really good job to the point that I'm definitely going to buy this service from them. And, and you, oh, right. Uh, Right. Oh well, thank you for that. I'll no. I I I I I, I remember um, undertaking a visit to a school with David Bell, who was the chief inspector, and it was shortly after a conversation I'd had with David, whereby I'd said we were inspecting schools for five days, and we were sending five inspectors into a primary school, and I said, David, it shouldn't really take that long. No. You know, and he said, "What? Well, what do you mean by that?" I said, "Well, actually." I said, um, you can get a feel for this fairly quickly. I said, what you need is a bit more time to get the evidence to make sure that you haven't got it wrong. And he and he said, well, um, test this out. Uh, well, we were, we were in a school in Luton. We were just chatting about it. So a couple of weeks later, I took a couple of colleagues um, who had very little experience of primary HMIs. And we didn't do an inspection. We just visited for a couple of days um, with, with the cooperation of the school. And it became very clear that, you know, when you're, you've got a reasonable range of experience and you've got something under your belt, you can get to that fairly quickly. But if you haven't, you can't. And I still remember a, a, a math specialist, very earnest, very hardworking, and, and, and probably a brilliant maths inspector who just couldn't get this sort of primary feel. And it always made me feel as though, actually, you know, this only works, the system that I helped develop will only work when you've got really experienced, knowledgeable, you know, well-trained, you know, uh, rounded individuals doing those sorts of uh, evaluations, because you can get them 
you force people into making judgments about things they know very little about and you end up then with great variability and you do a disservice to the profession if you're not careful or a lot, a lot of work on indicators rather than evidence exactly so that you 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 look for the indicators and to test it we would we took a group of head teachers from a different authority around a school at four o'clock so the school was was virtually empty and we asked them to to say what they thought the issues were with mm. this school and they were absolutely spot on <laughs> started with, with uh the head teacher having um a head teacher car park position with with a name on head teacher only and, and from then on but but they got they identified the weaker teachers they they identified the stronger from empty classrooms i mean that's, that's fascinating but because say that. when it comes back to your point frank that with that, that maths colleague if we're not careful when we make it all about evidence rather than the, i was going to say indicators stand for the same reason then it just becomes about individuals own conscious and unconscious bias it's trying to look for what they already know, understand, and they value, which in different phases, different contexts, different areas of a country, different types of schools, becomes a, a race to the bottom, actually, in ever decreasing circles of, but I want to see what I would do. Well, that's great. But what you do is on a spectrum, and it may not be applicable here, and it may not be fit for purpose. And that's why I think indicators are exactly the way to look at the, the, the role of education and it's, that's really interesting Stan though that empty classrooms can tell you so much but I suppose they do though don't they yeah <laughs> it's remarkable you, you can well the, the, some of the heads there actually described what they thought the teachers who were running that classroom were like and they weren't a million miles away <laughs> Dan, what's got, got, got to move on here folks got to move on <laughs> Dan what's caught your eye this week um, been on Twitter and social media, been very interested in some of the reaction uh, from class based teachers around the war in Ukraine and set against particularly the guidance on the DFE around impartiality and and it's showing actually a bit of a nervousness around. Well, what does this mean in this context? Because it feels like there's this big test of the guidance in one way, because it do, do you know does it mean we're meant to present the russian side of view is it bbc style impartiality and i think that's one of the difficulties about how the guidance has landed in the sector because in its own the guidance is actually quite helpful because it really just codifies what we've always done there's nothing very strange or startling about it whatsoever but i think because actually because it it's been landed in a way especially with some aspects of the press as if this this is um because of so much political bias that exists in schools mm -hmm. therefore it's set against this sort of you know cliff edge of fear it's it's caused an issue in the sector with people actually questioning whether they can talk about ukraine in an open and honest manner and i, I think it's one of the unintended consequences of how policy development and policy launches is set against that broader context of the culture wars and discussions around woke and discussions around many, many aspects. But ultimately, what's really clear is the impartiality guidance has no impact on how we should be discussing and teaching Ukraine. And in fact, you know, there are some specific points around um, ensuring that we are advocating against criminality and advocating against um, aspects which go against fundamental values such as free speech. So it's a no brainer. On the other side, it's been interesting to see just how many colleagues are now nervous as a result of it. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah. it, it's shown just how much the guidance has created a, a, sen a bizarrely a sense of grey area and anxiety when it was meant to address what is quite a simple point. But perhaps the guidance really, because it doesn't add much to what we've always done and how we've always been advocates of the Equalities Act, it's interesting to me that for some colleagues it seems to have muddied the waters. I do think it's helped though, is it when the Secretary of State actually met a couple of weeks ago, or was it a few months ago, you know, took the example of an individual teacher's decision <clears throat> to enable their children to write to um, a politician about something, you know, and how that was then used as justification for a revisit to this, you know, 
um and how that actually the timing of all this just feels you know it's, it's very unfortunate isn't it that you know we're now it's now sort of highlighting probably that if if nothing had been said the whole thing probably would have remained where it was where i think it was safely positioned yep. and everybody understood but actually intervention has made it more confusing and i you know i think for me i, I also worry about i mean my my daughter um who's been a guest here her neighbor is russian and they've had a conversation about how they're feeling you know yeah. how and she it's the point she's saying you know when we say about i'm a russian what does that actually mean you know i'm i am british but but what are my values you know um you know and, and actually at the heart of it it's 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 more around young people understanding i think this this range of views and actually that does mean to say that we can't say to them you cannot have that view you need to ch if they have a view that needs to be challenged you know I don't think it's right for them to for us to then be saying to them you can't hold that view you know you, it, the view needs to be dispelled or it needs to be argued down or whatever or it highlighted what's wrong with it it's really interesting Frank. we did a, a research project in burnley uh not long after the riots uh where we we looked at racism in in the schools uh and of course at the time the uh the highest incidence of of racist reported was in reception in, right. in most in most schools <clears throat> because the children at that age say things that that affect them you know mm -hmm. it might be you wear glasses it might be your fat it might be that you're a different color than me but they they say it and what we found from the research was that what we did as a as a society i suppose is say you shouldn't say that yeah we didn't do an understanding of it we didn't say yes it's natural mm -hmm. for somebody to see something different and you know it's it's a natural reaction to say you're different than me uh but we, di we didn't do the understanding bit we just say no you shouldn't say that we like suppress it until these children get to be about 14 or 15 where that repression doesn't help anymore because they're, they're not at the point of taking words of the teacher that says you shouldn't say that they, they feel free again to say and and instead of understanding instead of really getting underneath it all yeah. and talking it out we, we were just actually suppressing it for a time period yeah, yeah. Well, i think that's the danger of exactly this because if we think of the and here's the other point around this it's guidance yeah, and true, the, true. The, law, the law remains the same and the equalities act in 2010 gives us two key duties and i think it it, it relates to what you're talking about stan to eliminate discri discrimination we should say you sh you shouldn't say that if it's a negative the contested space is what advancing equality looks like and therefore the contested space is i suppose it's that difference between being non-racist and anti-racist between between being um non-sexist and being positive in our overall framing of of sex and gender and that is a more difficult space actually because i mean the, the difficulty with the whole piece is education in itself is political of course it is it is a political act I think teachers have been for a very, very long time and going back even to, you know, um, Section 28 days, always been more cautious than anything else about revealing our own individual politics and and also being very, very careful to ensure that we we are promoting and teaching critical thinking. Yes. And I suppose what, what I don't want to see is guidance that means our sector and colleagues within the sector become more anxious about that critical thinking which is actually essential to children's sense of self and sense of by belonging and identity but also their sense of citizenship and and improving and progressing those rights and experiences for anyone who's minoritized yeah, i think it'd be fair to say at the moment that to, to students and children there, there are two sides to every story and at the moment, we only get to know one side, uh, but there is another side, which we don't, potentially, we don't understand at the moment, um, but it, it's still there. Um, well, what's, what's caught my eye this week? Knighthoods. <clears throat> um, I, I really uh, struggle with this. Um, on the, I mean, I uh, th let me just deal with uh, the, the knighthood to Sir Gavin Williams, which I find actually quite the whole of that quite difficult to to take in. Um, 
but actually i'm just thinking about i understand the the, the significant pressure that that person faced mm. during you know a, an unprecedented time but there there were some real terrible mistakes made the one that sticks in my mind is the assault on London authorities who wanted to close down their schools prior to Christmas to get the sort of the, the break here yeah, mm. over the Christmas period a little bit longer because of increased infection rates and they're being taken to court and then on the I think it was was it the second or third of January the Prime Minister saying that actually we're going to open on Monday tomorrow because it's safe yeah. but by Monday night we were closed you know now this is actually the Secretary of State is actually meant to be responsible for all of this there were loads of others whether it's the free school meals debacle you know where actual teachers were actually having to do food parcels out from their own funding to pay to give to families that had no food you know the algorithm frank the algorithm i mean there's you can go on and then also the the, the reason why he was he resigned or forced to resign from a previous ministerial role you know so actually this actually feels really really bad you know because it smells of patronage and it and and the suggestion is and it's the only suggestion that you know if you know something that could be damaging we're gonna sort of make sure that everything is protected around you so that you don't feel as though you can sort of break rank now for me i mean i i got an mbe a couple of years ago and it's made me think about whether i should hand it back and within that i i had no idea i was being nominated for this and 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 when i got it i was conflicted and i still remain conflicted but actually i look my mother and father would have been over the moon if they were alive at the point of me getting it and i i thought the best thing to do and i've spoken to my wife about it is not do anything it's just in a way use this platform to express how I feel about the whole thing, but it does diminish the the uh, honour that I got because it, it it makes you feel as though I'm I'm with that, Is, and that's a more senior honour than what I got. Uh, but when I uh, the one thing I would say is that when I was when I went to get the award, I was with people who I could blind me, you know. I I felt very humble, you know, being with. I remember a, a, a woman who has her entire life has been about trying to address um uh abuse against women and a, and a, and a, a, a very brave gurkha soldier who'd lost a limb um mm. you know and you think oh wow you know, and having the chance to talk to them you think oh i'm i'm elevated i feel elevated to be amongst you lot you know and i'm not worthy to receive it how gavin williamson can stand in that hall you know and he won't stand in that hall because he, he i don't know if you're aware but or the senior posts, they go off on the left hand side as you go up to the palace, the more lower awards go to the right. So he won't be sitting and standing with everybody in advance There'll be two or three people there, how he can actually mix himself with that group of people, there is a massive divide between his award and the and the work he's done and the work that other people have got to get a much more junior or less senior uh, award. Uh, it, what, it is shocking. What's the award for services to, because I thought I read somewhere, services to Britain, which seems a bizarre well, thing for somebody who's been a minister to. Uh, I, I, to I think we all, we're all, all, we should all get that award. Hmm. We should. Well, isn't that part of the point? But, I mean, Frank, it, whatever one's views of the honour system overall, the point is, those who deserve it are like yourself who will always have a bit of an imposter syndrome around it because it comes from a place of humility and authenticity i think the the sort of perceived slap in the face on this one is the fact that that's not what an imposter will feel when they're awarded it because actually they will feel deserving and, <laughs> but it comes back to an important point which is the the it, whether the rights or wrongs of this um are debatable but i think there's a real clear consensus certainly amongst um the profession and indeed amongst some parents and carers about this but a bad apple does not necessarily upset the entire cart and it comes down to this if, if you sit down and you work hard and you get an a grade on your on an exam and the person next to you cheated and got an a it doesn't devalue your a it devalues mm -hmm. theirs 
And your point is really important. The honour system really means a lot to a number of people. And I think it's, I think you honour that honour. And the fact that this may not be honourable is certainly something we all need to think about and it should be discussed. But don't allow it to devalue your own achievement and the recognition that your communities wanted to, to put in place for that. Because recognising you meant something to other people. That's really important. It was really, that's very kind. I mean, I, I, I was struck. I, 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 it, this was a declared on a Friday. And on the Saturday, Arlene, my wife and I went to Newcastle, um, where I was talking at a co-op party um, co conference about education. I remember being with Anna Turley, who is no longer an MP, but an absolutely amazing woman. I mean, just she needs to find a place somewhere back in educate uh, uh, back in uh, Parliament. But uh, I remember Anna um, being so pleased that the cooperative movement had been recognised. You know, and and a lot of people in the audience, I, I don't think are monarchists at all, but actually could see that there was some good publicity <laughs> about the fact that I'd got it. And I, and I was really struck by um, how how well received that news was in, in the audience. So, you know, it did lift me. Um, I was obviously very pleased to get it. Um, primarily because I think my, my wife was over the moon as well. But but the fact that the co-op the co-op group, I think, had, were the driving force for me to get it. And, and I didn't want to say to the co-op group, oh, well, you know, I, I don't really want it. You know, mm -hmm. my mother and father, my family, my wife, you know, all of this is all playing into the. So in a way, the, the thing for Gavin Williamson is. How does his family view this? How, how does his wider family view it? How do how do his constituents view it? You know, I, I, I'd be surprised if if he if he was received as warmly as I was at that conference, if he met a broad range of people from within the people that he knows in quite the same way. But anyway, do you know what? We've been talking for about 35 minutes here. <laughs> <laughs> it go, no, it goes so quickly. It goes so quickly. Um, I mean, one thing, I, I, just before we, we close up, Dan, I mean, one thing that we spoke about at the beginning uh, and we got onto the co-op there, is the way that the co-op values are and principles sort of are embedded into your work and and i think you felt as i got a feeling that they were much stronger where you are now you've been able to make them stronger i don't know if you want to just explain how you've made that real for your community that you're serving well um i was very lucky actually because it the formation of the trust i lead had been based on a number of cooperatives already so i i have been educated in the cooperative <laughs> I work in in this field but I think for me so the cooperative values are around self-help self-responsibility democracy solidarity equity and equality and in many ways those are the fundamental British values in my view yeah the thing that I've really started to to understand and unpick is the principles that lay underneath those values and the democratic fellowship that means those values you know then as Mary Meyer would say they're not laminated they're lived <clears throat> they are they are the behaviors we exhibit and we role model and we promote but they're also a really important point of self-reflection on where do I need to improve where have I not been my best self or done my best work or where are we as an organization and for me we talk about them as values but actually we talk about it as our moral compass for civic leadership and who we are and who we are becoming. And I feel incredibly privileged to, to lead under the cooperative movement and to work within those fields because it's empowering. It's, it's all about empowering and it's all about an activist approach which gives voice and agency to those who often don't have it, whether that be children in, in schools or whether that be more broadly in our communities. I personally am someone who education is about liberation, not control. And the cooperative values and the principles that underpin them are all around agency and about the choice to become an active citizen. And so for me, it's it's just been incredible to to match my personal values with my professional beliefs in a way that feels really quite deep actually and that's something that both sustains and nourishes me but gives me an ability to really also check myself 
and to take my ego out of decisions and leadership, which believe me is a journey still. <laughs> but but it, it's one where I know the, the steps to take in a much clearer way. And it's it's been it's been huge for me actually as a as a person and as a leader to to find that home for my own beliefs and therefore for the shared values we we can lead by. And I'm I'm, I'm so privileged. Yeah. I I, I, my only, the shame for me is that I was in my mid, well, sort of, you know, mid fifties when I stumbled across, you know, this sort of the, the co-op values and principles. I wish I'd, I think I had some of that in me anyway, but being able to articulate it through those values and principles and to actually sort of reflect on it, um, it came too late, I think, in my career. Um, and I, I, I envy your youthfulness and your ability to to sort of do this in reality much earlier um because i uh, yeah i i it would have affected so many things that i that i that i did do you know if i'd only had that insight a little bit earlier you were laughing at that stan weren't you because uh, of, I, I, uh, what i was re remembering frank is when you first went to the co-op and and we went for a, a pint uh, or two in manchester not long after maybe two or three months after you joined and you were already full of these values. And that was the first I think I'd ever heard mm. of the co-op values. And I remember even just that conversation really influenced some of my thinking. And I know when I worked with schools after that, I, I was kind of saying, well, you could create a set of values for your school that mean more than your school motto. You yes. can do something yes. that's livable. And that was from a, a very simple conversation in a pub but it, it it obviously got got to you quite deep very rapidly and in that one conversation i went away with wow that's that's really powerful if schools use it to their advantage well i can close this up here now because i was very fortunate to be working with people who had been cooperators for much longer and their their role was to not not to force this down me but to actually sort of just allow me time and by chatting to me and through discussion, I get a better understanding how it all fits together. And I have to say, Dan, you know, you've there's a guest today. You've there is a, a sort of sureness of your <clears throat> your sort of way in which you convey what you're about, which you know is for me as an individual looking to work in a trust. You know, this this would feel a very very good place to be. You know, and uh, I'd I'd sort of. You know, in a in a way, the points that we were making before we filmed about, you know, uh, service being a key element of your work. I think you know that's come over very strongly today. So uh, thank you for your time. I know it's been a difficult week for you as well, uh, Dan. So thank you for your time, and uh, thank you everybody for watching and listening. And we'll be back next week. Um, I think we're going back to a, a, a class teacher next week, as I guess. So uh, we look forward to that. So uh, we'll see you all, all being well in uh, seven days time. <laughs>